Hello and welcome to the Fit and Healthy Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirsten Lauritsen, and today I have Joe Orbacheski. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> With me today, uh, he is a doctor of physical therapy and has been practicing for the past eight and a half years. He is a board certified specialist in orthopedics and is a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the NSCA. He is the owner operator of Pure Drive Physio and Performance, located in Southern Maine. He primarily works with golfers and fitness athletes, but has worked with various athletes of varying ages and abilities. When Joe isn't working with clients, you can find him spending time with his wife, friends, and family or out on the golf course. And I see we also have a friend with us today. <laughs> we do. Yeah. We have a little, a little cat named Nigel. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he's, he's pretty much like a dog. He's like always okay. there. And that's exactly why we didn't get a dog. Cause I didn't want that, but here we are. Here so. we- <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you with us. Um, do I'm you wanna, so excited to be here. Yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? I know I just gave the bio, but do you want to just introduce yourself? Tell me how you got into golf and into doing what you do. Start sure. There. Yeah. Yeah. We could do that. Um, I guess I started playing golf when I was in high school. Um, just was playing with a friend who happened to be on the golf team in high school. And then he said, Hey, you're you're actually kind of good. Do you want to come out for the golf team? And I said, okay, sure. (laughs) Um, And then I played on the golf team in high school. Still wasn't like amazing per se. So um, it's not like a ton of people were trying out for the golf team at that time. (laughs) Um, And then I've been, and then I've been pretty much playing uh, on and off since then for the most part, kind of school and work and just other priorities have kind of taken place. And then, um, you know, actually owning a business that works with golfers you surprisingly play not as much golf as you'd like to (laughs) when you're uh the one man show so yeah um trying to get out more but with uh our first our first kid is on the way as well so that's gonna uh, probably also reduce that time thank you um but yeah so that's kind of much how I got into golf and then I just really I just enjoy working with golfers mainly because I I enjoy the game and I can connect with them uh, on that same level. Um, and that's pretty much what led me to where I am today with working with them. Again, I, I work with all kinds of different athletes, but that's the yeah. main, main niche that I focus on. Oh, I love it. Well, how also then did you get into physical therapy? Why did you decide to go that route? Yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, I had, I had a typical, the typical thing is like, you get injured, right. You go to yes. physical therapy and you're like, Oh, this yes. is a cool job. Yes. So I, I did get injured. Uh, I broke my femur and I have uh, uh, some hardware in there. I had mm-hmm. surgery, yeah. but um, I had PT only in the hospital. And I only recall like one PT home visit. And then I went to the doctor, like the ortho, and he was like, hey, things are looking really good. Um, just kind of ease back into things. And that was it. So I never really had PT. Sure. Um, I think the main thing, main driver is that um, one, subconsciously, my dad, well, not subconsciously, my dad is paraplegic, has been my entire life. And I, I've, he's very abled and does pretty much absolutely everything um, that he yeah. absolutely can. And yeah. I would just help him with stuff. So subconsciously, I think that was just like ingrained in me of like helping people. And yeah. then he actually did uh, bench press competitions and all of his friends from work would be at our house. We had a gym in the basement sure. and three days a week, uh, they'd be downstairs lifting weights and I would come home from school and go downstairs and do my homework while they were lifting weights. So I was just around How cool. uh, like getting stronger and people doing active things or exercising, I guess. Yeah. And so when I was in high school, you know, you take those tests of like, what should you do or what should you be? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and most of them were like athletic trainers mm. uh, were my results. And I didn't really want to be uh, at the time, I guess, like an athletic trainer. Um, so similar things were like PT and I went, went to a PT office and shadowed and was like, oh, you basically like help people work out. That's cool. <laughs> um, and so that's pretty much what led me down to that. Obviously, there's a lot more to being a physical therapist than just uh, taking people through exercises, which like, yeah. the paperwork part, which is the worst part of the job, but yeah. uh, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Well, that's, it's, that's a very common way to get into, (laughs) into any of the, the, like I'm a chiropractor, but it's the same thing, right? We all typically get injured of some type and that's a very typical path into our professions. (laughs) Um, Very cool. Well, so there are, um, 
Well, the reason why I wanted to have you on the podcast is because you have a great way of melding sport, but also really good functional movement, strength, and just having also like a healthy body. Um, and that can help promote performance. So I wanted to start off with like, why would you suggest that a golfer has a fitness coach? Yeah. Um, golf, even though it doesn't seem like it, it, you know, has this stereotypical thing about it. It's a, like an old man sport basically. So yeah. why, I mean, if someone can do that, you don't probably need to be very athletic. Um, if you look mm -hmm. at most professional golfers these days, um, they are athletes and they're trying to gain yeah. a competitive advantage out on the course. And they're learning more and more that part of that is fitness. Um, and I think it's, you know, for the everyday amateur, you know, depending on where you're at, you're just going out and having a good time and playing and trying to get better. Um, but for the most part, most of most golfers, everyday golfers are not, you know, trying to get on tour or those kinds of things, which is fine. Sure. However, it's still relatively easy to get injured in golf. And, you know, part of that is people just tend to not take care of their bodies or, or doing the things that they should to, you know, honestly exert the forces that they're doing in a golf swing. I mean, a golf swing takes less than two seconds, but yeah. the amount of force that you're exerting on your body, in particular, the spine, um, is, is a lot. I don't have uh, hard numbers off the top of my head, but it is a lot, um, yeah. especially if you're trying to swing over hundred miles per hour. Um, you're, you're doing a lot. And even though it may be quick, but when you're practicing, going to the driving range, hitting, you know, yeah. 60 to hundred balls and maybe playing at least once or twice a week, you're doing a lot of, of things to your body. And if it's not prepared to take those forces, you might be in trouble at some point. Sure. Gosh, we could take that in many, many different places, but let's go into what are some of those very common injuries that you usually see? We can take that like the amateur route first, and then we can kind of go pro elite route. Yeah. Let's go amateur first, or like just people who generally are playing golf, but maybe not doing any other type, like as their form of exercise and not necessarily doing any like strength training or anything else. Sure. Yeah. I would say this is probably true for both amateurs and professionals is the the number one area that is typically injured or has pain is the low back. Yeah. Um, after that, it's typically, I would say either the shoulder or elbow. Um, mm -hmm. and then the golfer's knee. elbow. <laughs> yeah. Golfer's elbow. Common. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times. Um, so those would be the main ones okay. for the most part, some hip pain as well. Like, you know, you can kind of throw that in with the back you know, you should be looking at that at the same time from like a clinician standpoint. Yeah. Um, so those are the kind of the main areas. The back is pretty much, if we we're going to go from like a um, SFMA, FMS model, kind of, you know, we're looking at alternating joints of mobility and stability. Mm -hmm. The low back is pretty much should, should be remaining stable for the most part and transferring that force from the ground to the upper body in the golf swing. And yeah the two spots that should be rotating are primarily the hips and your mid back. Um, if you're lacking rotation along those areas, typically your body's still going to do what it wants to do. Um, and you're going to steal some of that from your low back, um, which again, isn't necessarily a bad thing or wrong. It's just when you're doing it a lot and mm -hmm. you're doing it with a lot of force, some things can happen um, and some tissues can get irritated. And when they're irritated, they get angry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we see, well, and, and then that I think can translate to, to just different movement patterns in other and pains in other places as well. Right. You just, it's just right. like this snowball of effect of if one area is not moving well, and then you just do that and repeat that pattern a hundred times, <laughs> like there, you know, it's probable that you're going to maybe have some pain. Um, so and then what would you say from maybe more of like our elite pro level athletes, what are some of the injuries that are really common there? Are they similar? They're similar. It's definitely mainly still low back is the okay. main area. I think yeah. that's more of just um, the repetitive nature of the, of the sport. sport. And yeah. they're just, I mean, they're elite for a reason. Most of mm -hmm. them, you know, on a driver are swinging over 110 miles per hour. And I mean, they're probably not always hitting a driver, but they're hitting hundreds of balls every day mm -hmm. um and they're just continuing to exert a lot of rotational force 
um, on their body. And again, that just over time just takes a toll. Um, yeah. I mean, Tiger Woods is the perfect example. Um, I mean, he's hit who knows how many golf balls his yeah. entire life. And I right. mean, when you're swinging like him, um, again, that's just a lot of force on the body. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how can strength training, well, we'll break this into two pieces. We'll go into like functional movement, but how, like also strength training, how can strength training be a, a benefit in this case? Sure. Um, well, just to go off of like a research standpoint, most research in terms of like physical therapy, like interventions, right. In terms of pain, most of them are actually kind of average at best, because there just needs to be more kind of evidence that's true of anything. But the one that holds true for most things is getting stronger. So creating some change of the muscles and the tendons, as well as, you know, the ligaments that surround each joint, all of those things, if you're strength training correctly and pushing yourself a little bit to force those muscles to adapt and change will help them obviously get a little bit stronger. So when there is a, you know, a good amount of force, they're able to withstand that same thing with the ligaments around the joints. So getting stronger, is going to be helpful in reducing your risk of injury, but also um, not only will getting stronger do that, but it'll also help you out on the course in terms of maybe improving your performance, right? So hitting the ball further. Um, and I have yet to meet a golfer who doesn't want to hit the ball further. That's, right. <laughs> I don't think that's ever been the case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then as far as like movement patterns, patterns go and how, like, how can working on, so you just explain how strength can translate right to having more explosiveness and, and being just having more speed. And that's a really important aspect, but how can then working on movement patterns and, and mobility then transfer to that as well? Right. Um, I think again, I kind of lean a little bit more towards that SFMA FMS model of like that alternating joint stability and mobility kind of thing. Sure. Uh, it's not a hundred percent true. Right. But, um, it's a great visual for people to understand. And, I would say there are one or four major like rotational centers in terms of mo mobility for golf. Um, that's the neck, uh, the shoulder, your mid back and your hips. Those mm -hmm. are like the main areas you're rotating around. Um, the hips and the mid hips and the mid back definitely play the biggest role in that, in terms of, you know, rotating around your a stable spine into your backswing and downswing. Um, again, we've kind of already alluded to if, you're lacking some of those, you may rob some mobility from somewhere else, like the low back, yeah. um, maybe even the shoulder or somewhere even else down the line. Like you may do something else with your hands or your wrist to kind of get the club back on path. And just over time that may help contribute to maybe like golfer's elbow or tennis elbow, one of those things, right? Um, and so being able to have that mobility in those areas, as well as doing those functional movement patterns. Again, I mean, one of the biggest ones is a squat um, in like the screen for TPI, which is Titleist Performance Institute, which again is pretty much goes off of FMS, SFMA. Yeah. Um, they do an overhead squat and a lot of times people fail because of their ankles are tight or their calves are tight for, for lack of a better term. Um, well, either their calves or their ankle joint. And I even though it doesn't seem like it would be an issue for the golf swing, when you actually look yeah. Um, I, when you look at elite golfers, once they start coming back down from the top of their backswing into their downswing, they're squatting a little bit, not to the point of where it may seem significant, but a lot of times TPI has basically found in amateur golfers that, that people who are failing the overhead deep squat because of tight ankles will usually exhibit a swing characteristic of early extension, which means just coming out of their yeah. posture. Um, and that essentially uh, just creates inconsistencies in your swing, right? So if you're someone who, um, I mean, if you're a golfer, you'll understand this. Like if you pull, if you pull the ball a lot or you're coming over the top, like that'll force you to change your hand path again. So a lot of inconsistencies in your swing. And the last thing that you want as a golfer is inconsistencies. It's pretty frustrating because that just leads to uh, higher numbers on the scorecard, which isn't good. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's always really interesting though, right? Because we have a tendency to like, let's say you have low back pain. We have a tendency to want to focus there, right? Because that's where the pain is. Um, sure. But when you actually, so when, for, for those of you listening, if you're not familiar, he referenced FMS, um, FMS is a, is a functional movement screening. And it's a, it's a way that we can like, look at from, as you mentioned, like ankle to neck, almost like how the entire body is functioning through patterns. And that leads to a much more comprehensive way of figuring out how your body is moving through all the patterns that you need and are using functionally like in golf, (laughs) but also though, they can lead to addressing where some of those pain areas may be coming from. But, you know, it's just always so odd. Like if you have a, a PT or a chiropractor and you go in for low back pain and then they start working on your ankle it can be a little bit off-putting because you're like but wait my pain's here um but I think that's one of the things though that is starting to really change and improve in a lot of these areas and fields is is that it's no longer just about treating the the area of pain um or like chasing pain in a sense it's more about um helping to address what's causing the the pain in the first place and um so as far as, and, and the, the thing that I love is the feet and ankles, like ankle mobility is just one of those, those things that I think a lot of people, including myself have, have dealt with and, and, um, maybe that's a generalization, but in, ankle mobility is definitely one of those things that gets overlooked, I would say. Um, and is a, as a really, and I mean, I know that in golf, you see a lot of the rotation through the low back, I feel like, but there's a lot of things going on with your feet as well. <laughs> Tons, so, yeah. Ton of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So as far as I, I mean, I just want to like dig deeper into some of these areas where we're s- different causes, different areas where we're seeing, um, just this health picture, um, with, with our, with our golfers. So as far as low back pain and causes, let's just start there. Um, besides function, um, like the functional movement, what are some of the other things that you commonly see as, as common causes as well? Um, are you, yeah. In terms of like, just to clarify, Oh yeah. From like the golf swing per se. Um, yeah. Let's start with that. And we can, we can go from okay. there. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put in my two cents, um, after sure. this, but you go ahead and take it from there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So again, I would say in my experience, the most common causes again, are those limited mobility in the mid back and your hips. And we can, again, start to tie in a little bit, potentially, um, if you have the opportunity to see a golfer swing, and that person in front of you with low back pain, you might see some swing characteristics that are uh, maybe contributing to that. Again, it's breaking down the rest of that screen as to why those things are happening potentially as a cause of their body. Now, all of these things could also be uh, a problem because it's just their technique with swinging, or maybe they have an issue with the equipment, like their clubs are too long or too short, right? So that's where maybe seeing a professional, a golf professional in terms of like swing technique is huge, as well as maybe an equipment uh, fitter who can kind of get you set up with the right stuff. Um, beyond that, some swing characteristics, again, early extension is a big one. So basically, um, if you can imagine someone in golf posture, that's where their hips are thrusting towards the ball, basically, as they're coming down on their downswing. Um, so again, it's almost like they're standing up. A lot of times people will top the ball sometimes and they'll say, oh, you picked your head up. Um, when in reality, they didn't really lift their head. They just stood up some more because their hips extended and now they're standing up basically. Um, but if you can imagine doing that a lot, potentially and forcefully, again, that's maybe a lot of um, extension through the spine that it's just not ready to, to do. Um, again, if that's the cause who actually knows, right, per se with low back pain, it's very uh, complex. (laughs) Um, The other one that is huge in terms of low back pain is called a reverse spine angle. So um, if you're you're now looking at the golfer face on, so they're about to hit the ball and you can see the ball in front of them. When they go into the top of their backswing, they are actually now leaning and tilting towards the target with their upper body. So if you can imagine, yeah. again, just from like a, a 
kinematic standpoint of the spine, right? They're almost extending and they're rotating and they're also crunching down onto that lead side, typically the left side for most people. And again, doing that a lot of times uh, and then trying to come out of it is also not great because they have to kind of unwind almost, unwind almost, yeah. right? Again, yeah. exerting a lot of force, um, again, potentially on an area that's not meant to be rotating too much per se in terms of like the low back where they should be rotating through their hips and their mid back. Um, those seem to be the main, like in terms of like swing characteristics that are causing some low back pain. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, I would say to a lot of evidence now, just in general, not maybe not necessarily related to golfers is that people with low back pain tend to just have weaker backs. Um, and that just goes back to um, working on getting stronger, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, have been reading some very interesting studies because I'm looking at low back pain um, from a different perspective, just being in I'm transitioning more out of chiropractic as a sense and into functional medicine a lot more. Um, I combined both at the start of my practice, but I like to practice nutrition and functional medicine way more than I do chiropractic. So one of the things that I've been actually looking at and seeing um, several studies is that there's there are obviously, um, I mean, just as a chiropractor, I've, I've helped a ton of people through low back pain, just from fixing just the same thing of what you're talking about here, strength and, you know, functional movement and things like that. But it's also interesting because there are several studies that are looking at low back pain from the perspective of inflammation. And, um, there, they, they looked at like how GI health and how the gut and inflammation that stems from there in your immune system can also translate to the like low back as well in low back pain and what we experience there. Um, and I just think it's really interesting because there's, a, you know, I know that there are a lot of people who are able to fix their low back pain from the perspective of just changing movement, but there's definitely there's definitely another layer there, right. Of things that can be happening, especially for anybody, um, that is dealing with just pain in general. Um, and so anyway, that's, that was, uh, an interesting thing that you and I talked about before this podcast is that there are so many different reasons why somebody could be experiencing low back pain. Oh yeah. I mean, it's so multifaceted, right. As you mm -hmm. know, as like a, a practitioner nutrition, you know, yeah. what you're putting into your body's big stress, uh, sleep is huge. Um, just previous bouts of back pain and what caused it. And yeah, I mean, yeah. there's a laundry list of things. <laughs> I know. Are there some other health issues? Um, I don't really want to necessarily put them that way, but are there some other health things that you've seen, um, referencing, like maybe even like dehydration, you mentioned nutrition, things like that, that you commonly see with golfers. Yeah, I was going to say, and we talked about this a little bit beforehand too, was, you know, a lot of times just in general, again, most people tend to not hydrate probably enough or yeah. they're hydrating with not ideal things, especially when they're playing golf. Yeah. You know, golf is typically played obviously when it's nice, pretty, pretty warm, might be humid outside. Yeah. It's really easy to get dehydrated just by sweating. And uh, even if you're riding in a cart, and you're walking just a little bit to your ball and here and there, I mean, it's still easy to just get dehydrated. And absolutely. I mean, I, I would say there are times when I've gone through a whole round of golf myself and I bring my 32 ounce thing of water with me and I drink it and I don't ever have to go to the bathroom because I'm just sweating like crazy because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. so hot and my body's just like filtering through water. Um, you add on the fact that a lot of golfers tend to use it as a so play golf as a social thing and right. they will end up drinking some alcohol right which we we do know is uh a dehydrator or uh i don't know what i'm looking for right amongst now, right other now. things but yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> that will yes. affect your hydration levels uh -huh. um add in the fact that they may not have fueled up properly before the round um and then typically the most most of the time most golfers don't bring snacks or if they do it's something one thing like a little pack of trail mix per se which has you know depending on the trail mix could be good or not so good yeah. um and then or they'll grab some like the easiest thing typically is like some hot dogs that's like the most common thing like some hot dogs and some chips again not the best choices 
to be right. making. Again, I'm not saying that no one should ever enjoy <laughs> hot dog or some chips, but again, those things might affect how you're playing. Um, and we had talked about a study that was done. I don't have it memorized, but I have it up here. So basically they looked at um, hydration, dehydration, how that affects your performance in golf. So they, it's a very small study. This was done a while ago too, like 2012. And they only looked at, I think they had seven golfers who were pretty much in college. Their age was about 21 years old and they were considered low handicap. Basically they had a handicap of like two to four essentially, which is pretty good. Uh, that's pretty low. Um, you're almost pretty much shooting par every time. And basically they looked at um, how they did beforehand before they made them dehydrated. So they have them hit 30 balls to given targets. They measured like your accuracy and your distance. And they also showed them 30 different golf location images. And then they were asked to judge distance of like how far that, how far that would be to the hole. And you can imagine these golfers are, are good, obviously, right? They're on college yeah. teams and they yeah. have low handicaps. So then a week later, and then they retested them in a dehydrated state. So they restricted their hydration 12 hours before they tested them. And they allowed up to like, I think 3% loss in body mass okay, um, sure. to be considered mild dehydration. Yep. And what they had found was basically that being just that little bit of dehydration is basically going to affect their motor control and cognitive ability. Um, it was found that they had some significant statistically significant impairs cognitive motor task performance showing that it compared distance on their shots accuracy of their shots and distance judgment during golf performance um which um is pretty much golf <laughs> so yeah, i mean that's hit, it in a nutshell isn't it <laughs> if you can't hit it to the distance you wanted to and if you can't judge distance and you're not accurate you're definitely going to sacrifice uh some strokes out on the golf course that's just from right. being quote unquote, mildly dehydrated. Um, and those are good golfers. Right. Um, if you're right. not, if you're not up to, up to that, uh, playing ability, you can probably extrapolate what that would might do to your game per se. Yeah. And I mean, just gosh, dehydration in and of itself is something that that alone can lead to, I mean, okay. So here's like the thing where hydration. So I, as you know, like my, we talk with a lot of triathletes here in this, in my, in my world, because I'm definitely in that, but it applies to all athletes. Um, you know, if you're going into, uh, your day dehydrated, and then you go into the next day dehydrated, and then you go into the next day dehydrated, you're, you're entering into the space where those, that it's almost like chronic dehydration and it might be mild, but the effects of that, you know, it affects your, your recovery. It affects your uh, ability to your, it affects your muscles, right. And your joints and your tissues. And it, I, I love the cat. I know our, our <laughs> listeners won't be able to necessarily see it, but our YouTubers will, <laughs> yes. um, no, but you know, it's, it's, uh, I, okay. I have to stop here for a second because I used to have a tabby. I used to have two tabbies. My, I grew up with a tabby cat and then, um, I also had another tabby, um, just a few years ago and she, she's not with us anymore, but I just love, love, love tabby cats. <laughs> They're my favorite. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I digress. Good cat. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm like, a, I'm an animal lover. I have two dogs indoors. I have two livestock guardian dogs outside with a bunch of chickens and I've got a couple of cats around here as well. So, you know, I'm just, I got animals go. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll get back to that. So when you have chronic dehydration and when that's something that is just consistently coming up every single day, it will affect your performance. Um, and for, for golfers too, a piece of, I, so like, I may not necessarily be a golfer myself, but I'm very aware of how the sport works <laughs> and like, you know, that part of what you want to is like, if you're going to go and train and you're going to go spend time working on technique and doing all those things, part of what we want is to absorb that training. We want to be able to recover and we want to be able to lay down the, the, you know, the, the, neurons and all of those movement patterns and things that you want tomorrow and then the next day and then the next day and and part of that does rely on hydration so there's not just this piece of like performing on the day of but there's also this 
daily habit and this, this, the recovery patterns as well, that like absorption of that training is a very big piece of being able to perform at a really, really high level. And sure. Like you might be somebody that just plays golf on the weekends because it's a fun thing for you to go do and it gets you outside. But there are, I I think there are a lot of people that may not be in the pro space, but still want to perform really well. Yeah. I mean, I would say most golfers, uh, again, this will be a generalization, but most golfers want to play well and they want to get better. Um, I would say that goes for most people with most things, right? Like you don't Mm want to just suck at something. Yeah. It's typically how you start, um, but that's how you also get better. Um, And most of the time golf is a funny thing where, you know, you might get paired up with someone who is pretty good and you're like, man, I want to play like they do. Right. Or, and more often than not, this is what happens. I would say to probably almost everyone, which is what keeps golfers coming back. You have those one or two shots that just happen to be like Mm. exceptional. And you're like, all right, you took my money for the next round. I'll be back. doesn't matter how else yeah. I do the rest of the rest of today. Yep. It's something's there, right? So it's people always want to get better. And yeah, if you're, if you want to do that, hitting those, uh, most of the time for most golfers. And I would say for most people that those low hanging fruits of getting enough sleep, getting enough hydration, eating the right things mm-hmm. are going to be the things that lay the foundation for uh, your performance. Yeah. I actually saw a video. I don't know who to attribute this to because I don't actually know her name because it was on TikTok. (laughs) It was shared to me and I was like trying to track down who it was and I couldn't find it, but she was basically saying, and I really agree with her that, um, you know, in the past, the, the people who were, were performing really well were strength training and female or male, right. Uh, athlete, but now, if you aren't strength training, you're behind pretty much. And, but, and then what she was also saying though, is that what she thinks now is coming up, which I agree with is that nutrition and knowing how to eat specifically for you and for your sport and hydration and all of these pieces of like taking care of your body to be able to perform well. And everything that goes inside of that is that next strength training piece from the last like decade. Right. And it's the people who are figuring that out and getting on top of that, that are, that are now those peak performers, right? They're the ones that are really performing really, really, really well. Uh, And I, and I do really agree with that. I think there's, there's so many studies now that are showing like how important just these simple things are that we do in our day to day that really translate well into sport and into performance. And yeah, you know, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes I've had some people come up to me and say, yeah, you know, by the time I'm playing like hole 14, I'm tired, like I'm fatigued Fatigue. and I don't know how I have have it in me. And I'm like, you know that this person has enough endurance to get through 18 holes. Like in theory, you need to have 18 holes. We'll say on average takes, we'll just say four hours, which is a long time, but like that is a long time. there's a lot of factors that play into that. Like how play is if it's slow and whatnot but um if you're walking and you know maybe carrying your clubs or at least even pushing them you're walking up and down hills i mean it does get tiring um that's where i think endurance is big for golfers at, to a certain degree a lot of times people say oh just walk um i think that's good but um i'm more of a person who has people push themselves a little bit now i'm not saying you don't have to go walk for five hours yeah or like train for a marathon but I think getting your heart rate going a little bit is going to be helpful even for those little bits in between. Um, but a lot of times I try to just go back to nutrition and I have a little Mm -hmm. thing here that I put together that I didn't mention before. I thought of it as we were going through, Nice. but a lot of times, like I have it broken down by, by holes. So like you obviously should be eating beforehand if you have that option. Yes, um, you know, definitely. And that's going to vary depending on your preference, right? Some yep. people like to eat 30 minutes before. Some people don't like to have absolutely anything for like two hours before. So you just mm-hmm. got to find what's right for you. Definitely want to have something that's high in protein, moderate fat, moderate carb, basically to get, just get everything ready. <laughs> um, yeah. Holes one through six, I definitely recommend something that's like lower carb and and some fats that'll sustain like the early part of the round. So I usually recommend like, a banana with some almonds, apple with some peanuts, sure, um, an orange with mixed nuts, and then holes seven through twelve. 
now you want to try to maintain your energy levels with some protein, carbs, and fats. So this is where like, again, a, a well-chosen protein bar uh, with a banana or apple, you know, if you have the option to pack a pack a lunch, whether that's like chicken or tuna salad, yes. um, having some jerky um, with some nuts and seed, or even just like peanut butter and banana, which is usually my go-to because um, it's not going to like go bad. You don't need to necessarily keep it cold per se. Yep. Um, it's usually good. And then holes 13 through 18, you want to get that like where people tend to get fatigued, you want to get that last boost of energy. So you're going to have something that has a little bit more sugar in it per se. So again, trail mix, maybe with some of that, like some M&Ms or chocolate chips that are in it um, yeah. and some dried fruit. And that's going to help mix out some of that. Basically, you want to get that high insulin spike, but you also want to balance it out. So having exactly. some fats to like bring that down. So you don't spike and crash. That's exactly mm -hmm. what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Um but that should hopefully help you sustain like the rest of the round in addition yeah. to also being hydrated throughout the rest of the time. Um, yep. So having something with electrolytes and I tend to not recommend like Gatorade or Powerade because most yeah. of it's just garbage. Honestly. Let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That's a really, that's a really big misconception. Um, and I, I feel like too, when I start talking about this, I get the response of like, well, it's not that bad if you don't have it all the time, but I really want to frame this though, in the perspective of like, just as you mentioned in what we're talking about, like, if you want to get better, there are, there are reasons why we talk about these things. <laughs> so yeah as far as like Gatorade and Powerade and those types of, you know, when we're talking about electrolytes and why we don't necessarily want to be hydrating with like Gatorade or Powerade. Do you want to dive into that? I, I mean, sure. I can take it too, but if you want to go into that, please. Yeah, it. I'll do a little bit. I don't yeah. know a ton of stuff, but um, first of all, this is just like an aside and it, it goes with it, but I was thinking about and preparing about talking about these things. I yeah. was like, used to love Gatorade. And like now yeah. when I drink it, I'm like, God, this is so sugary. Uh -huh. I'm like, this is just straight up sugar. Like how did I just drink this all the time? I know. Um, so that's the first problem. One, it's sugary. It's mm -hmm. a lot of sugar. Um, again, if you're not balancing that out with something, you're going to have that insulin spike and a big crash basically is what's going to happen just from yeah. drinking Gatorade or Powerade, which isn't going to be helpful for you. So you're just going to get more fatigued. You're going to have a little bit of boost of energy and then it's going to go down quick again. Um, the other thing is that even though there are electrolytes in there, which are great, I think some of the other stuff that I've read and have learned from some other nutrition folks is that there's a lot of dyes, obviously, yes. in Gatorade and Powerade. And yes. some of those dyes are um, help, not help, they uh, do the opposite of help right now. <laughs> like yeah. don't help you absorb some of those electrolytes and, and, and nutrients in your body. Um, so they're basically doing the uh, antithesis of what you're trying to do. It's almost like, not to like throw her under the, the bus here. I don't even know her name right now. Whoever runs Goop, um, oh. <laughs> she talks about pH and lowering your pH, but then talks about uh, throwing lemons in the water, which is going to make it uh, acidic. <laughs> so sure. like she wants it to be alkaline, but having lemon in the water is the opposite. So, but you know, you're doing the exact opposite of what you want to do basically. Yeah. It's interesting. So like with Gatorade, when it first started, um, it was created for a football team in Florida. Um, and it wasn't even like a, like NFL football team. It was like a high school football team basically. And what they, what they, what, how it was started was it was a little bit of sugar and a little bit of salt at a one to 3% solution. I think, um, something, something along those lines. But the thing is though, is it doesn't, that, that doesn't usually taste super awesome. Um, and, but, but it was working really well for hydration of these teams. So then it got picked up by bigger football teams. And then it turned into what Gatorade is known as today. But the thing is though, is Gatorade as it is known today is at a 6% solution or more of that sugar and salt carb um, blend. Right. And so the problem with that is that when it gets dumped into your GI tract, which if you think about it this way, like you don't typically just like sip on Gatorade, you usually drink a fairly good amount of it within an hour, right? Like if you're putting all of that into your gut in 30 minutes to an hour, that all of that solution going into your gut is not, it doesn't function the way you would think. Um, and, and what ends up happening is your body will pull water from your, 
from your body, from your muscles and like all these other places. And then it'll pull it into the GI tract. Um, and the, the, basically the way that the water flows is different than what you would expect. Like you would expect that it would go into your small intestine and then it would just like seep into your bloodstream and your body, and then you're good, but it doesn't really work that way. And so what ends up happening is you sort of get this like functional dehydration as you get further and further while your body's trying to process all of this. So if you're outside, right. And you're in the heat and it's a very, very hot day. This is one of the things that I work with triathletes all the time with is because they usually have like Gatorade on course and things like that. And I just, uh, have to kind of go through a process of cautioning with those, with those drinks, because they do the opposite of what you think they should be doing. Um, and the same thing's going to happen, even though you may not be running and biking for hours on end. If you're outside, like you're going to be sweating, you're going to be getting dehydrated. You are moving, you are doing a lot of things. And, um, just finding a hydration, like electrolyte drink that is well balanced for hydration is critical. Now I will say that I do know that there are differences. There are some people who sweat a ton, so they're going to have a higher electrolyte need versus people who don't necessarily sweat as much. And so they may, they may function better at a lower um, electrolyte balance. And I do realize that, and there is a lot of room for specificity there <laughs> per person. But the, the point that I always try to drive home is that like, you don't necessarily like as the golfer need to know that, like how all this stuff functions. Um, but what I, what I love the takeaway to be is that you can learn some of these basics and know that like, there are going to be certain things that are better for you than others. And to at least kind of have an example or a, a general idea of knowing why that's the case puts a lot of power in your court as an athlete, um, because you can make really good choices for yourself. Um, and so that's, that's my caveat on Gatorade and power. <laughs> no, yeah. I always recommend I'm, I'm a person who can get away with just water. Um, yeah, I sure. need to have like some sort of flavor or taste. I can mm -hmm. understand why people do. I get it. Like sometimes I crave something with some sort of flavor. Um, I, I mean, I typically will tell people to just fill up some water and then I recommend usually like Celtic sea salt has yes. just like naturally occurring yep. uh, minerals and vitamins in it and yep. all, all those electrolytes and it's, mm -hmm. it's taste free. And um, if you can add like just a little bit of like real maple syrup, you um, go. you get that, you get to take advantage of both the sodium and glucose transporter in the gut and your cells. So you'll actually pull that water into your cells versus allowing, cause like plain water too, can sometimes flush the body of sodium and electrolytes too. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's like, there's I a like lot that. of really great things there. And I love the Celtic sea salt. Um, there's so many different salts that you can try. Um, and that's also another thing that I've found depends on the person. Uh, there's, sure. there's definitely even more that you can explore with that too. Um, just as far as changing up the different types of salts as well. It's, it's a really fun, it's so crazy that you can get so specific on hydration, but like the benefits of it can be huge. It is. It's, anyway, it's crazy. And I think I just wish more, I just wish more golfers would pay attention to it um, yeah. mm -hmm. and think about it. I was, I tend to just try to get and tell people after every hole, when you're walking or riding in between each hole, just take a little sip. You don't yep. need to gulp it down. Just take a little sip, build that into your habit and your routine. And before you know it, you're just going to be doing it and you're not going to be dehydrated. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just going to be there. Oh, I love it. And then also that leads to better recovery after your four hours out on the golf course. I mean, there's, there's so many, so many aspects to that. That's just, I love it. Oh, I love it. Um, <laughs> do you have any other things that you wanted to cover today that we didn't go into? Um, in terms of performance, I would just say, you know, the biggest thing is like golf with most sports is getting more and more data driven with, yeah. with the wearables, the it's when it comes to golf, I mean, you can track, you can hit on a simulator or even out on the course and have one of these fancy track bands that cost like 20 or 30 grand um, and see all these different numbers of your, your shots basically. And you can use that to your advantage 
for sure. And I think some of that's important. Um, I think the big thing for most golfers, again, is hitting those low hanging fruits in terms of performance. So all mm -hmm. things we already talked about, like sleep, nutrition, hydration are huge. Yep. Um, after that, it's going to be for the most part, um, working on mobility of those specific areas that we talked about again, like neck, mid back and hips and shoulder. Yeah. Um, and then after that, it's more so just like getting stronger. Yes. Everyone wants to do like the sexiest drills that they see on social media, um, that all the professionals are doing, but sometimes those aren't always the best thing to be doing for you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you want to throw med balls and do all these different things. And I think you should to a degree, but, um, because golf is really a, sh a very explosive and powerful movement for really only half your shots, technically, because you should be putting twice, which is really nothing. Um, you really just need to focus on getting strong for the most part, because it's all about generating force through the ground. And the stronger that you can be at doing that, the better you're going to have a chance of increasing your swing speed, which just means you're going to hit the ball further. And we know that that means you're closer to the hole, just easier to get it onto the green at that point. So All those good. things just kind of play into that. Yeah. Um, I think if people just spend time just getting stronger and working on their mobility, they'd see their game improve. They probably have less aches and pains. Um, yeah. And ultimately, um, golfers want to play this game for the rest of their life. Um, and that's one reason why a lot of people love to do it is because they can, um, you know, they mm -hmm. see the, the guys and, and the ladies who are doing it into their nineties and they're still playing. Um, yes. if you want to do that, you have to start doing things now to make sure you can get to that point. Um, yeah. Yep. and that's, what's important. My grandfather was one of those. Um, he was, I think 90. I don't think it was until recently, like 90, he's a hundred now, but I think he, he, he finally didn't have his golf membership. Like, uh, I don't actually know the details, but maybe at 97, 98, maybe. Um, and that was like a huge part. I mean, he walked the course, the majority of that time. Um, I think when he got into his nineties, maybe, maybe like 92, he started actually like using the cart. I don't actually know the details, but I do know that he was still walking the course, even in his nineties, like That's it's awesome. incredible. And I, like, yeah. I, I really, I really think that one of the reasons why he's a hundred, uh, and still with us is because he was, he kept moving. And this was one of the things that he liked to do. It kept him outside, you know, and it was just a piece of incorporating exercise and a sport in a way that's also fun and something that you enjoy. And there's some social time there too, often for a lot of people. And there's a lot of aspects of that that are really, really great. Um, and I, I second everything that you said. Um, I do, I do feel like I'll say one last thing on it. I do feel like we have a tendency, just as you mentioned, like with the new data and the new ways that we can be like looking at all these fancy things and creating all these fancy strategies out of all of the, the, the stuff and the technology that we can get. We also, I also feel like we have a tendency to see a very, very big focus on like, well, if something's not going right, well, then maybe we need to change equipment or maybe we need to change, you know, um, coaches and like all of these different things and all these factors. But in reality, if you actually look at like the foundation, um, for that athlete, sometimes it is, it's a strength issue or it's a mobility or movement issue, or maybe it's the nutrition and the hydration and all those other pieces that are often just neglected. Um, and so I, 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 I've, thoroughly enjoyed this, this, um, interview today and having you as a guest, um, Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And uh, I hope that we can have you back soon. Um, this was this was great. And I love talking about different sports. So thanks for being with me today. No, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it as well. I'd love to come back and talk about anything, really. I just am a huge performance person. So anything Heck is yeah. always good. Anytime. All right. Well, take care, everybody. And we will be back next week.